The austere beauty of the green hills of Glamorgan has been ravaged for two centuries and more. Upland and valley are still scarred by the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution, but the scars are healing. A record of how they once were has been left by Malkin. In 1803, he wrote of the amphitheatre of the hills and the luxuriance of hanging woods dissected by the Taff and the Ronda, each rolling impetuously over its bed of rocks. George Wood eulogised on salmon leaps and waterfalls. Half a century later, George Borrow tells of noble mountains, green fields and majestic woods. All is still there except the salmon, but the unsullied parts are fewer and so more precious. People in South Wales are looking now to horizons beyond those which bring immediate profit in cash or kind. Operation Eyesore has repaired some of the damage. Nature reserves are being set aside before all our wildlife habitats are irretrievably lost. The Glamorgan Naturalist Trust and local authorities are safeguarding more and more of the quiet and lovely corners, holding them in trust for the people of tomorrow so that all shall know how it once was. Parts of the picture are black indeed, but even the blackest cloud may have a silver lining. Over the past few decades, the starkness of the slag heaps has been relieved by a green and yellow mantle with pale flecks of pearly everlasting. Underground shoots of this attractive North American invader penetrate the unpromising black masses, stabilizing them against gully erosion. Contributing further to stability of the new tips are fairy flax. Plowman Spikenard. Wormwood. And Silverweed. Pale toad flax joins the ferns sprouting from last century's pennant sandstone walls. Tufted vetch produces the ginger seed pods on which the next generation depends. Two colourful relatives of the willow herb grow among the industrial ruins. The central stigma of the evening primrose splays into four arms to receive pollen from another flower only after its own pollen has been shed. Rose Bay follows the same pattern. Buddleia turns up sooner or later at every abandoned mine. Not for nothing is it called the butterfly bush.
Given sufficient time, nature will hide the tips completely, even to the extent of producing a new woodland. Now that man is recognizing his past follies, he is beginning to lend a hand. He knows that he is part of the natural world of living organisms, and that if he destroys his environment, he destroys himself. From a tip summit, the kestrel hovering high above the mining village seems far below. But most of the unlovely ribbon development over which he seeks his mouse or vole is confined to the valley bottoms. Step back a few yards and the miners' cottages disappear. The coal field has taken on the garb of a great green and yellow plateau and the hand of man is seen only in the forests which he has planted and the farmlands which he has cleared. Five of the areas selected as nature reserves lie in the mid Glamorgan coal field where the two branches of the Rhondda River flow down to the Taff and so to Cardiff and the sea. They range from the bleak crags and lake of Cragathlin, just over the watershed in the north, to the softer lowland woodland and stream of Coidabeda in the south. In the Rhondda Vach Valley, Darren Park at Ferndale nestles at the base of a great wooded cliff. Parts have been quarried, but most remains as it has always been. The ice and snow which scoured out this cliff during glacial times also scooped out the foundations of an attractive lake at its foot. Oak woods of the coal field suffered severely when charcoal was needed for the smelting of iron ore and pit props for the coal mines. The few on the steeper slopes which escaped are precious and this one is now scheduled as a local nature reserve. Small tortoiseshell and peacock butterflies visit the fleabane flowers. Chaffinch, greenfinch and robin forage on the woodland floor and bullfinch in the tree canopy, as have generations before them. Ancient trees house families of greater spotted woodpeckers. Blackbirds succour their young, as in the more halcyon days before the aura of coal mining descended on the valley. Stretching away in all directions are the peaty soils of the Pennant Sandstone Plateau. Little streams spin silver threads down the mountainside, nurturing water crowfoot, which flowers almost throughout the year, raising white blooms aloft for pollination by insects and pulling back the fruits to ripen beneath the surface. Delicate blue cups of ivy-leaved bellflower peep shyly from the grass. Pink trumpets of lesser skull cap grace the stream sides. Commoner but no less beautiful are cross leaved heath and tormentil.
cheap sorrel manages to eke out a living in the poorest sites. Skylarks are here the year round, but wheat ears are to be seen only in summer. Where the water gathered together below the lake was a fine patch of bog land. This was brightened by the Turkish towelling flowers of the bog bean in spring and the mashed yellow of the hairy musk in summer. This musk, the one which suddenly lost its scent, is much rarer than the common musk which romps along the polluted river below. With it were lesser spearwort, the delicate pink of bog pimpernel and lacy white of marsh bed straw. Unfortunately, the value of this unique little area was not appreciated. By the time the on the members of the Glamorgan Naturalist Trust realized what was happening, it was well on its way to becoming a kickabout area for children who already had thousands of acres of open mountain to play on. Those who cared enough about the richness of their heritage rallied round to move some of the rarities to another bog further up the valley. The sun was low in the sky before the precious cuttings reached their new quagmire. Dusk was well advanced by the time they were installed. The Ronda Borough Council cooperated by dumping several lorry loads of the squelching mud in another local nature reserve at Glyn Cornell in the Ronda Bar Valley. This stretch of steep woodland with fish pond and quarry pools lies below the broadening of the valley at Ustrad. Here, by a tinkling woodland stream, both bog bean and musk put down roots and multiplied. The The stream empties into a tree-girt pond at the foot of the hanging oak wood, where the leafy reflections hide a wealth of underwater life. Greater water plantain spears upwards by the angler's little boat. Grey wagtails snap up morsels floating past the old wooden jetty. A stray fish leaps momentarily into a world which is not its own. Others ghost through the dappled light and shade among curled and Canadian pond weeds. Some fall prey to kingfishers, waiting patiently on willow twig or mooring cable. Stonewort grows beneath the water, lesser spearwort at the margins. Pond skaters skip lightly over the surface film. An old quarry, abandoned nearly a century ago, nicks the face of the wooded hill. 
the warm tones of the man-made pennant cliff back a string of little pools where the water lingers a while in its tumbling descent. Where silt collects between boulders, sneezewort spreads white orbs to the sun. Here too grow the unruly flowers of ragged robin. Willow herb produces drifts of fluffy seeds to be wafted away by the wind. Jointed rush sprouts red tassel galls in response to attack by a jumping plant louse. Woolly bear caterpillars race each other up and down the rush stems. Small tortoiseshell butterflies play in the sunshine. Plans are underway to establish an environmental centre here for countryside studies and outdoor pursuits. The ever-changing succession of plant and animal life is full of surprises and stimulates powers of concentration. White heather is lucky and spiders not nearly so terrifying as mothers make out. Birds of prey nest among the trees and rocks of these steep woodlands. Sparrow hawks, once declining, are now on the increase. The chicks wait impatiently for their parents to bring a meal. They are near to fledging. Soon they will be catching and plucking their own woodland passerines and urban sparrows. The wealth of nesting holes in birch, rowan and alder is shared by pied flycatchers, red starts and woodpeckers. It is always handy to have a tradesman's entrance. The hen pied flycatcher is drabber than her mate, but just as busy. Few are more gorgeously apparelled than the cock red start. Once again, he and his drabber spouse share a hole with two entrances. Green woodpecker chicks waste no time in accepting the pre-digested porridge of insects brought by their parents. The domestic affairs of all do not go according to plan. A gluttonous young cuckoo has taken over the nest of a pair of meadow pipits, filling it to capacity. It sends out crimson signals to tell its foster parents that it is as hungry as ever it was. The outsize gape proves an outsize incentive, stimulating the unfortunate meadow pipits to bring more and yet more food. There is no let up for them, even when the insatiable youngster leaves the nest. Long after the real parents have set off for their lazy winter in Africa, they will still be stoking up their monstrous foster child for its own unguided passage south. The tree pipit is more fortunate. These caterpillars are destined for its legitimate offspring.
The two Ronne rivers converge and flow down together to join the Taff at Pontypris, where another nature reserve has been set aside at Coed Gethly Drouse. The path winds upwards from the town to skirt a monster coal tip, where time, the great healer, is curing man's neglect. The black waste is hidden beneath a self-sown carpet of purple heather. Were it not for the marauding sheep, this coal-based heath would have become a woodland by now. There are a few seedling oaks, the acorns very likely brought by jays, but most survive only into their second summer before getting munched back. Eared sallow survives by growing sideways. Even the moisture-loving alder finds water sufficient for its needs in the unfriendly-looking slag. Birch is the tree most likely to get away, though only a fraction of the multitude of airborne seeds makes the grade. The victors rise as from a tilted field of corn. Others which succeed are foxglove with its myriad tiny seeds and hawk bits with their wind-wafted parachutes. There is little now to indicate that the tip is not as primeval a landscape as the adjacent hillside of birch-dotted heath and bracken, playground of tomorrow's citizens. On the opposite side of the path, the slag is new and the story very different. Thistle, yarrow and sticky groundsel still hold sway. Grayling butterflies are as characteristic of coal tips as of cliffs. Their cryptic camouflage can be even more effective here as the warning eye spot of the upper wing is withdrawn after alighting. In these early stages of tip colonization, plant nutrients are still in good supply and plants such as carline thistle and great malign can grow. It will be a long time before the rain has leached away these minerals to give the acid ground needed by the heather. Fungi of many kinds exploit the sparse organic matter in the slag. This is the way it was at the approach to Gethly Drass in 1971. By 1972, man had contoured the unlovely waste to blend with the natural rally sides. By 1973, the grass was beginning to grow. By 2073, only the experts would recognize this as a man-made landscape. Times change, and not always for the worse. At 88 years of age, Willie Charles Thomas is still scrambling around the coal field, taking an intelligent interest in its geology. Three quarters of a century ago, at the age of 12, 
He was underground here, working at the coal face, pulling back the lumps which fell from his father's pick. He is justly proud of the presentation miner's lamp, received 75 years after his inauguration as a founder member of the South Wales Miners Federation. The old colliery reservoir, now that it is no longer needed as a water supply, makes an attractive pool in the wooded valley. Superficially, it is all that a lake should be, but the waters are thick with silt and the shore almost pure coal dust. Tiny spire-shelled water snails weave silky trails through the black sludge. A sawfly larva fallen from a branch escapes very adequately from the ooze spinning netted threads of foot marks as it goes. The fringe of float grass arching out over the silt-charged waters grows as well in coal dust as in soil. In the cathedral stillness of the wood, the coal dust is forgotten. Foster and Cliff wrote in the 1840s of cliffs of singular beauty, feathered by trees and copsewood, of air full of the scent of wild flowers, where a Sabbath stillness reigns. It is the gem of Glamorganshire. Little but the discarded oil drum mars the gem of Coid Gethly Drafts today. The Coida Bedder Nature Reserve lies at the very edge of the coal field, where the river escapes to the coastal plain through the Taff Gorge. To the south is the beechwood of the Little Gar, occupying the border ridge of the Carboniferous Limestone. To the north is the moorland scarf of the Great Gar, occupying the south crop of the Pennant Sandstone. The reserve, a complex of wet woodland dissected by streams, is strung out along the valley between. A vixen idles in the early morning sunshine. Streams draining into the valley from the border ridge are alkaline. Some flow out of old hematite mines, from which the iron ore was carried in mule panniers to the Penturk Forge below. These waters are so charged with lime from their passage underground that their calcareous burden is deposited as tufa where they emerge. Fallen leaves are petrified and sticks encased in brittle white tubes. The whole stream bed becomes as frozen as the calcite curtains of a limestone cavern, like the fur from some gigantic kettle. Streams draining into the valley from the coal measures are acid. Some flow out of old drift mines, where horses once plodded stoically around iron turntables drawing tramloads of coal from the heart of the mountain.
Alkaline and acid waters together nourish a mixed woodland with alders and sallows in the wetter parts. Dependent on the sallow leaves are the striking caterpillars of puss moths. These can be seen in July and August, either drawn up into defensive attitudes to scare would-be predators or nibbling away methodically at leaves. Iris flowers brighten the woodland floor. The sweets of the valerian flowers tempt a drone fly. Other creatures pursue secretive lives beneath the water. Caddis cases of tiny pebbles are cemented to the stream bed. Other caddis, similarly encumbered, crawl among the freshwater shrimps. Pond skaters dance their bubble ballet at the surface, their dimpled footprints mirrored on the stones below. One contingent takes a rest and is joined by a water cricket. Such creatures provide for a good population of brook trout. The size and numbers of the trout can be assessed by electronic fishing using a pulse unit powered by a Honda generator. The metal cathode is placed on the stream bed and a container made ready to receive the catch. The operator works in an upstream direction, preceded by his wandering anode and nylon catching net. His gumboots are shockproof as well as waterproof and he knows better than to guide the fish into the net with his hand. The bigger the exposed surface, be it fingered or finned, the bigger is the electric shock. It is quite fascinating to see how a fish can alter its pigmentation to match its background. A trout wearing dusky colours which camouflage it against the dark stream bed changes rapidly to paler brown when placed in light surroundings. The fish are recorded and measured before being returned to their home territory, none the worse. Lesser creatures like these nymphs of damselfly and mayfly recover even quicker. Toads, frogs and newts caught unawares suffer no more harm than the fish, though no doubt a little startled by the new experience. This toad finds good hunting on the grassy woodland floor. Grass snakes haunt the streams and marshes where radially symmetrical shoots of giant horse tails splay from the shadows. They are too quick off the mark to get caught by the wandering anode. 
That quivering, questing tongue is a sensory organ, tasting the atmosphere and serving as an early warning system. Slow worms have no great liking for the water. Though by no means slow, these legless lizards sometimes need to shed their tails to escape a predator. This stumpy end, sliding between the primrose leaves, will grow anew, but will not attain the elegant tapering of its predecessor. Lizards scuttle among the grass. Banks haunted by these reptiles may be beautified by the pink of the rare crown vetch and soapwort. Shrubby Japanese knotweed invades the woodland margin. The tall canes of autumn are the product of a single season. But that is long enough for them to become partially lost under the floriferous coils of greater bindweed, which grows even faster. A hoverfly explores for nectar. A white butterfly flutters like a windblown petal beside a plump, less graceful bumblebee. Chiffchaffs are the first of the warblers to arrive in spring. Jays harvest the acorn crop. Greenfinches take lesser seeds. whilst a nuthatch slakes its thirst at a woodland pool. Plinvach, the little lake, lies in the high rainfall area of the north, beyond the precipitous source of the Rhondda rivers. Craig Llyn, the cliff of the lakes, is an impressive cliff by any standards. It rises to almost 2,000 feet to the very roof of the coal field, and 1,000 feet can make a lot of difference climatically. Bare windswept crags rear out of rain-sodden moorland and spruce plantations, leaving no place for the oak woods of the kindlier south. The Corrie Cliffs were scoured in the pennant crags by ice and snow in far-off glacial times. The frozen mass failed to break through the formidable barrier into the headwaters of the Rhondda, sliding instead eastwards into the Taff and westwards into the Neath. Flinvach, the smaller of the two Corrie Lakes, is one of the county's finest nature reserves. From the crags above, the foraging heron appears as a mere speck. Heron footprints such as these may be found etched on any shoreline, fresh or saline, but this habitat is a very special one. Both cliff and lake form an oasis of northern plants, more typical of North Wales than of South, 
many of them growing here at the southern limit of their geographical range. The county plaque was erected in 1972 by the chairman, Michael Rush, and a band of merry men from the Ronda. Parties of trust members visit the reserve from time to time to learn more of its unusual wildlife. These long leaves of shoreweed or littorella have drifted in from greater depth. As the water recedes in summer, they give way to smaller and smaller rosettes. The modest flowers of the dry phase may be no more than half an inch high. Quillwort looks rather like shoreweed, but the splaying leaves are stiffer and sharper. The genus is a lone survivor from a distant past, fashioned before plants started to produce flowers. Spores are born among the leaf bases. The chunkier clusters of flattened, tip-tilted leaves belong to the showiest of the rosette plants, the water lobelia. This is Britain's most southerly stand, rearing pale blue flowers on reddish stems. During droughts, this behaves like a land plant, producing flowers close above the sun-warmed shingle instead of over several feet of chilly water. Narrow-leaved burried pushes up balls of flowers from among floating rafts of leaves. A displaced shoot base shows the rectangular outline of air cavities from which deeply submerged tissues draw their vital oxygen supply. Ribbed stems of water horsetail catch the last of the sun's rays like ripening corn. These are puny relatives of the great calamites of the coal measures, ribbed fragments of which are scattered round the shore among fossilised debris from the coal forests. Remnants of a less ancient forest which grew here before the build-up of the peat are revealed on the lake bed under exceptional drought conditions. Too much rain and standing water spelt their undoing. At such times, the base of an old stone hut emerges from long years beneath the waters. Quantities of common and palmate newts and frogs spend their tadpole phase in the lake. Newt tadpoles skulk among the Fontinellis water moss, their feathery gills distinguishing them from the adults. And while they may skulk, for few will survive to adulthood, dragonfly nymphs are formidable enemies not often does a mere insect tackle a backboned animal in this redoubtable fashion.
Another mini monster of the depths is the larva of the great diving beetle, which will feed on animals larger than itself. One lurks among the water purse slain. It is unmistakable with its tip-tilted tail and powerful horizontal jaws, but the smaller water beetle is unworried as yet. A water hog louse takes a short ride on its back. The water boatman or back swimmer scuds to safety. Any of these little creatures might be found in tamer ponds of the lowlands, but there can be few wilder places in the whole of Britain than Craigathlin. It is always a thrill to come across one of the strangers from the north. The unfamiliar Calvary finds a root hold on vertical faces, scarlet spheres succeeding the white bells. Diligent search may also reveal the dwarf red-fruited stone bramble. Fleshy shoots of rose root sprout from the cliffs along with greater burnet. Crisp fronds of parsley fern cluster in crevices high above the more ordinary looking ones of lemon scented mountain fern with their marginal spore packets. Fir club moss is one of the few survivors of a group of plants which contributed to the ancient coal forests. Fragments of long extinct relatives can sometimes be found among the coal measure boulders below. It is here that Bog Asphodel rears golden spires from patches of quagmire. Caterpillars of the beautiful yellow underwing moth merge invisibly into the heather on which they feed. It is just as well, or more might be snapped up by the wheat ears. In the absence of reed, reed buntings build their nests among bracken and tussocky bog plants. They and the wing chats are also on the lookout for tasty caterpillars. The musical song of ring oozles emanates from among bilberry and rowan. Their neat nests are tucked away in dark north facing crevices or among tufty grasses, always on cliffs or steep screes. The cronking of ravens and the mewing of buzzards mingle with the soughing of the wind in the crags. Treacherous mists roll off the mountains, swallowing up the hardy sheep. The wanderer on the moors becomes a vagrant shadow magnified on distant banks of vapour. Scudding showers eclipse the sun, but the light returns, transforming raindrops into diamonds. Such stark landscapes stress that nature, not man, is the ultimate force. He may disembowel her hills in his search for wealth and spread his ugly trappings across her skyline, 
but he cannot quench the universal light. Men of vision are looking now to a brighter future beyond the dark cloud of their predecessors making, conserving the spreading uplands and the wooded coombs for their children's children.